One of the many songs that you've done that we haven't talked about that aged extremely well and gets to your roots is the Romantic Call with Patra, another plaque you have behind you. Oh. <laughs> so uh, being able to produce an actual real song with a reggae artist, given that you're Jamaican, et cetera, did that have any extra dimensions for you? Um, I did. I did like, like, like the one album has a reggae song on it. I mean, on Chubbs didn't rap in Jamaican. Right. He had um. He didn't get his patois on. <laughs> right, right, right. He had this other guy that did the patois in the hook. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, I always try to add some kind of Jamaican music out. You know, element. Yeah, especially oh, when I have magnificent, it. right? I'm the magnificent and all yeah. that. So when I had the opportunity to produce for a song for Patra, and she's Jamaican, Yo Yo was going to be on that song too. So I said to myself, "Okay, I know, I know Yo Yo not going to sound good on a reggae track." more reggae sound good on a hip hop track, right? So I was like, okay, should I make the whole track hip hop? It'll work. Then I said, nah, when it's Patrick turn, I put reggae. When it's Yo-Yo turn, I put hip hop. And I made it, I, I figured out a way to make it work that you don't, you don't drastically hear the transition. Right. <laughs> yeah, because that, that was a, a huge, huge song, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had um, Romantic Call when Gold has a 45. I wow. have a 45, a 45 with a cassette plaque. And I used to work at Warner Brothers in, in Burbank, California. Mm -hmm. And I had my own office. Somebody in Warner Brothers went in my office and stole that one plaque off the wall. Wow. What what did, what did you do at Warner Brothers and when? I used to be um I used to be A and R back in ninety-six. Okay. Wow, I didn't know that. So who who did you work with or were you doing stuff with like quest records or what were you doing no um um benny medina's contract was up mm -hmm. and he didn't want to be signed to run the back division at warner brothers right so as i'm telling you the story i'm telling you because now i find out certain things or why certain things happen come to find out warner brothers was trying to get rid of the Black Division, the Rock, and some other division. They were trying to get rid of that and they were trying to move mainly into television. They wanted to keep one or two, you know, from genres, I forgot which one it was, but they were slowly trying to get rid of those genres. So my lawyer, Denise Brown, had the opportunity to take Benny Medina's spot. So they asked her, and she said, yeah. So it was time, once she did the contract with Warner Brothers, blah, 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 now it was time for her to put her team together. So she asked me if I wanted to be one of her um, a and R rep. I've never done it, a and r before. I said, I don't know how to do it. She said, mm, it's, good. it's simple. You just got to find good acts. Well, I was like, all right. <laughs> so I ended up taking that position. Now, I thought I was going to be in the New York, Manhattan office. But she was like, no, nah, I don't know nobody out here in Cali. Why don't you move out here? Well, I was already out there. She asked me when I stay out there. The reason why I was in Cali at the time, Dr. Dre had a keyboard player. 
that played on his stuff, Fridays and all that stuff. He wanted to put on an album together. He wanted to be an artist because Dr. Dre and Sugar started Death Row. So he wanted to be one of the artists on Death Row. But, you know, um, it was a couple of other people that Dre signed to Death Row, but Dre didn't want to be the producer of all the acts on Death Row. So he always, so the, on the guy named Sean, AKA Barney, he always liked my stuff. So he wanted me to hook up with him and work on some demos. So he flew to Brooklyn. We worked on some demos. He went back to LA, made Dre hear it. Dre was like, oh, hell yeah. And I flew out there. That's when Dre was Dre was living in Encino. So um went out there, he had a studio at his crib. So he made me work, he made me record at the studio at his crib because Dre will always book studios a year at a time. He book a studio for a year. So the studio came in and they booked. And Shook had his office set up at k and right? You know, Shook is a blood, so the carpet was red, whatever. So Dre didn't want me to be in, mixed up in all that crap. So that's why he wanted me to record out of his crib. He, he, he didn't want me around that. <laughs> so we recorded a song that got maybe like five songs. Real good songs. I, I, I basically I put on like a LA hat that I didn't have, <laughs> and myself stuff style like LA. So we recorded the song. Everything was going good. Then Dre and Sugar had they falling out. So everybody that was signed to Death Row at that point was shelf. And the guy Sean, he was mad. Not he didn't leave California. He left America. Wow. <laughs> he just bounced. So I still got his demos and all that. So since I was already out there, and Denise asked me to do AR, I ended up staying out there and doing some AR. So now I only end up doing AR for like a year. Because I wanted to sign, oh what's the name of the group with on um, Well I Am? Black Eyed Peas? Black Eyed Peas. Black Eyed Peas had a showcase on Sunset Boulevard, right? And I went and checked them out. I was like, yo, this guy is hot. So I had their demo, got their demo for me. One of our a and meetings. I presented it. I said, yo, we need to sign these guys. These guys are nice. Bye, bye, bye. Warner Brothers purposely didn't give us a good budget to sign them. Hmm. That's why Sony ended up signing them over because, oh. what, because they would eventually want to get rid of black music. So they didn't want to give us the right budget to, to sign folks. That's crazy. <laughs> huh. That's wild. <laughs> Did you end up signing anybody? Um, Raw Breed, these guys from the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I signed them. Okay. <laughs> that song, Kalito's Way and all that. I have that because <laughs> it's like a blue cover, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have that album. Yeah. Raw That's Breed. We did, we did that at... Um, the iced tea script. Okay. How about that? <laughs> so then uh, we've been talking a long time. We'll have to hopefully have you come back again. But what um, is there anything that you're doing now you want to tell people about or have people look out well, for? I'm working on, I have a, a song on Chubbs. I have another, not. Not the same title, but I got another Howie's T-Dog. 
and I'm working with this girl named um, Crystal Johnson. I don't know if you heard of Crystal Johnson. Well, she sang, she sang most of the hooks on Mob D. She was on Temperature Rising. Yeah. And she sang on CL Smooth. Mm -hmm. P-Rock and CL Smooth. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Her and I, I knew her from way back in the days. We wrote a song for Tara Kemp. Okay. On um, the classic soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how I, I knew her. So now uh, I hooked up with her again a couple couple months ago when we were working on some song. She got this song, the sample. <laughs> the sample is a, um, I don't know if I should tell you. <laughs> the way I flip the sample, it's crazy. Well, but anyway. <laughs> I look forward to hearing it. <laughs> so I got maybe like three songs on her so far. You know, so I'm working on some songs. I gave Ed a track because I want him and I, I want to do this song with him and KRS. Okay. So, so I'm waiting for them to send me back the lyrics because, you know, our stuff is done now. People do lyrics. Just like the song I did with Chubbs. He did the lyrics and he emailed me <laughs> the lyrics and I synced it up. So now I'm kind of like in the middle of mixing it. Okay. Well, there it is. Well, Howie, <laughs> Howie T, man, I really appreciate you coming through, man. It's been it's a, all good, man. It's an honor talking to you, man. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for the invite again. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV has just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.